Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and today's topic of discussion is software simulation of parallel circuits. Our objective today is to make use of circuit simulation software to build and simulate electrical circuits and observe basic parallel circuits properties. My intention is not to bog this lecture down in the specifics of a particular circuit simulator's operating environment, but rather employ a generic circuit simulator for the purposes of observing basic parallel circuit properties and employing this tool to generate example problems for those individuals studying parallel circuits. For those of you unfamiliar with circuit simulation software, please take the time to check out the Software Simulation of Series Circuits lecture available at the Big Bad Tech channel. In addition to discussing series circuit properties, this lecture performs a brief orientation of a generic circuit simulator. In this case, National Instruments Multisim version 11. This lecture is meant to be a continuation of that same lecture and as such, I will operate under the assumption that you can navigate your chosen circuit simulator's operating environment and can build and simulate a basic circuit. As a refresher, circuit simulation software consists of a library of modeled components, which can be selected and placed into a blank workspace and then tied together using virtual wires. The simulator allows electrical properties to be observed from the comfort of your desk. Ideally, those values displayed on the virtual instruments are very close to those attained via calculation or real hands-on observation. That's the point. Circuit simulation software is designed to mimic the real world and those properties that govern it. Circuit simulation software is in effect a virtual laboratory. It is open 24-7 and has available an arsenal of all sorts of resources that are in perfect working order and absolutely free for the taking. For obvious reasons, circuit simulation software is the method of choice for those individuals involved in design and development tasks because circuits can be tested with a surprising degree of accuracy without ever having to purchase or wire up a single part. Additionally, circuit simulation software often takes into account real-world nonlinearities that for the most part we've been ignoring because they're negligible for our purposes and a real inconvenience to account for. Finally, circuit simulation software sometimes includes automated means of advanced circuit analysis techniques, such as transient analysis, Fourier analysis, and Bode plotters, as we'll learn in later lectures. In short, it takes seconds to assemble a functional circuit. Results are recognizable, and the circuit is easy to read. Feedback is instantaneous, and satisfaction is immediate with very little time commitment or physical labor. Circuit simulators are powerful tools with obvious benefits, but I emphatically caution you should not be employed to the exclusion of reality. The sole purpose of calculation and simulation is to support hands-on observation and analysis of a real-world electrical system. Our first task is to use a simulator to build a basic parallel circuit consisting of a single source and two resistors in a parallel combination. In this case, we'll use a 12-volt source with R1 as a 200-ohm resistor and R2 as a 400-ohm resistor. To belabor the point that voltage across components hooked in parallel is the same, we'll employ two voltmeters, one to measure voltage across R1 and the other to measure voltage across R2. In order to observe current, we need to place three ammeters, one to measure source current, one to measure current through just R1, and another to measure current through just R2. Realize this isn't just a plain vanilla parallel circuit anymore. Because of the existence of the ammeters, we're in effect creating a series parallel relationship. All current must flow through the ammeter used to measure source current. Only current bound for R1 travels through the ammeter used to measure I1. Only current bound for R2 travels through the ammeter used to measure I2. Via Kirchhoff's current law, I1 plus I2 should equal source current IS. Start thinking now of how you wire this up, not only with a simulator, but also using real world components and instrumentation. Recall, my sincere advice when using circuit simulation software is to 1. Place all components and indicators on the blank workspace prior to wiring anything together. And 2. Incorporate ammeters and components in series first before placing voltmeters in parallel as a final step. Disassembled, your workspace should look as such. Notice I've taken some liberties with the Properties tab for the source and the indicators and renamed them as E1. IS is the ammeter I'll be used to measure source current. I1 is the ammeter I'll be using to measure current through R1. V1 is the voltmeter I'll be using to measure voltage across R1. And the same for I2 and V2. There's no law saying you got to be clear and organized, but it sure does help. Now I can wire up just the ammeters and the resistors in a series relationship with each other. 
Then these two legs can be placed in parallel with one another. Then the source current can go into the ammeter IS, out of the ammeter IS, and into the top node of our series parallel combination of resistors and ammeters. The bottom node is routed back to the negative terminal of our source, and a ground reference node is attached to the negative terminal. Now one can incorporate the voltmeters in parallel with R1 and R2. The circuit is ready for simulation, but before doing so, this is an excellent opportunity to test your understanding of basic parallel circuit properties. Pause the lecture and solve for source current, the current through each component, and the voltage across each component. Here's how I'm going to solve for the desired unknowns. You might have used different steps in a different order, but ultimately our answers should agree. Using the most fundamental property of parallel circuits, we realize voltage across all components hooked in parallel is the same. E equals V1 equals V2, and they all equal 12 volts. Now we can use Ohm's law to solve for the current through each element. I1 equals V1 divided by R1. Substituting in the necessary values, we find I1 equals 60 milliampers. I2 equals V2 divided by R2. Substituting in the necessary values, we find I2 equals 30 milliampers. More current is going through the smallest resistor. Less current is going through the largest resistor. I'm reasonably confident our answers are correct. To solve for source current, we can use our understanding of Kirchhoff's current law, where a KCL analysis of this circuit again suggests IS, our source current, equals I1 plus I2. Substituting in the necessary values, we find IS to be 90 milliampers. We can now simulate this circuit and see if our calculated results are in accordance with that of the simulator. Our ammeters do in fact indicate 90 milliampers of source current is flowing through our circuit, 60 milliampers of which is traveling through R1, and the remaining 30 milliampers is traveling through R2. The voltmeters confirm that voltage across elements in parallel is the same. Let's discuss troubleshooting scenarios caused by faulted components. Consider this scenario in which the source current has dropped to 30 milliampers, in effect all of which is traveling through R2 and none of which is traveling through R1. Pause the lecture and use the instrumentation readings to determine the nature and location of the fault. For this troubleshooting scenario, there exists an open in this circuit, and that open exists within R1. In effect, no current is traveling through it, yet voltage is still dropped across the open. Additionally, notice source current has decreased to that sufficient to supply just R2. Current has decreased because the total resistance has increased because the opening of R1 has removed a path normally available for current. The negligibly small amount of current observed by ammeter I1 is due to the small leakage path presented by the 10 mega ohm voltmeter V1. Consider this scenario in which both source current and the current through R1 are astronomically high and the voltmeters have totally whacked out readings which seem to violate the most fundamental of parallel properties. I'll refrain from a detailed analysis of the voltmeters until we delve into series parallel analysis. However, understand that with such astronomically high current and the resistance presented by the indicators, they too induce a voltage drop which must be accounted for. The larger observation is this, 4 gigaamps. This is astronomically high current and there must be a short somewhere in our circuit. The shorted component is R1 because it too is drawing 4 gigaamps. The 20 milliampere current drawn by R2 is negligible in comparison to such ridiculously high current draw. A shorted component in a parallel relationship is something to be generally avoided because of its propensity to take the whole ship to the bottom along with it. Let's look at another parallel circuit with circuit simulation software and use this circuit to test our understanding of basic parallel circuit properties. In this case, the circuit is being simulated. However, only source current, R1, and the current through R2 is known. I've purposely modified the properties of the source and R2 such that their values are not displayed on the schematic. Pause the lecture and see if you can use your understanding of Ohm's law, basic parallel circuit properties, and Kirchhoff's current law to solve for the unknown values of the source voltage, I1, and R2. Again, a KCL analysis of this circuit suggests that IS, our source current, equals I1 plus I2. Substituting in the given values of IS and I2, and solving for I1, we find I1 to be the remaining 40 milliampers. Now we can use Ohm's law to solve for the voltage drop across R1, where V1 equals I1 times R1, 
substituting in the necessary values, we find V1 equals 20 volts. Using the most fundamental of basic parallel circuit properties, it can be said, no calculations required, that E equals V1 equals V2, and they all equal 20 volts. Using Ohm's law, we can solve for the unknown resistance R2, where R2 equals V2 divided by I2. Substituting in the necessary values, we find R2 must equal 100 ohms. When we stop the simulator, we can incorporate an additional ammeter to measure I1 and change the properties such that the magnitudes of R2 and the source E1 are displayed. When we press play, the simulator confirms our calculated values are correct. Again, I don't mean to bog this lecture down into the specifics of a particular circuit simulator's operating environment, but I do want to show some handy features available with NI Multisim for those individuals employing this software resource. I promise the diversion will be brief. I just want to show a couple handy tools for those interested in taking advantage of available resources. Here's a generic DMM being employed as an ohm meter. I grabbed this from the shortcut menu on the right hand side. Notice I'm employing it just like I would a normal ohm meter. Not only is the circuit powered off, it's also totally disconnected from the source. The ohm meter is reading roughly 83.3 ohms, in agreement with the calculations of a 20 volt source providing 240 milliamperes, or the parallel combination of a 500 and a 100 ohm resistor. The DMM has available a couple different modes, including an ammeter and a voltmeter in both AC and DC varieties. If you want, you can make use of this generic DMM instead of indicators. Here's an even more realistic version of a multimeter. It's a simulated Agilent 34401A DMM being used to measure source current. This model is astoundingly similar to the Hewlett Packard 34401A DMM I employed in the Intro to Ammeters lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel. I really like this feature because it reinforces the hands-on use of real DMM. The simulated DMM has the exact same faceplate and the buttons operate exactly like the real world equivalent. Notice the terminals available in the device faceplate are being employed in the correct fashion in the circuit to measure source current. Here's a generic watt meter I grabbed from the right hand menu to measure the power dissipated by R2 only. A watt meter, if you'll recall, is basically a combination of an ammeter and a voltmeter in a single package. Ordinarily, we need to take both voltage and current measurements and then multiply them together. The watt meter requires a more involved setup, but it does the calculations for you. First, I need to wire up the ammeter portion in series with the device I want to measure power dissipation, in this case, just R2. The ammeter portion is the two terminals underneath the letter I. Then I can wire the voltmeter portion across R2. The voltmeter portion is the remaining two terminals under the letter V. Notice the ammeter portion is in series with R2, and the voltmeter portion is in parallel with R2. Finally, I can double click the wattmeter to open its display window and then simulate the circuit. R2, being a 500 ohm resistor with 20 volts across it and drawing 200 milliamperes of current, is dissipating 4 watts as anticipated. Don't worry so much about power factor right now. We'll get to that when we cover AC circuit analysis. I don't want to confuse you but it's a quick measure of how synchronized voltage and current appear with respect to each other. This being a purely resistive DC circuit, voltage and current have no choice to be perfectly synchronized, so our power factor is 1. Finally, here's a tool I found useful to no end, the measurement probe. There are a number of different ways in which measurement probes can be employed, but the most common means is just slapping one in whenever you need a quick and dirty voltage and current measurement. The probe is essentially a single point measurement, quite like an ammeter. However, it can also relay voltage at a point with reference to another point. This probe I've inserted is measuring current through R2 to be 200 milliamperes. Additionally, the probe is conveying that this same point is 20 volts above the reference point, in this case, ground. Measurement probes save the necessity of wiring up a slew of ammeters and voltmeters. Here's not one, but rather four measurement probes inserted into the same circuit. Notice the probes indicate the current flowing through the single point is in agreement with an ammeter at the same location. Additionally, notice all the probes at the top node indicate they are 20 volts higher than the reference node as expected. However, notice probe 4 on the downstream side of R2 still indicates 200 milliamperes of current is traveling through it. 
However, this node has a zero volt differential with respect to the agreed upon reference of ground. It makes sense. A pure parallel relationship essentially needs only two nodes between which all components are hooked. Probes one, two, and three, although measuring different current magnitudes, should be at the same voltage, in this case, 20 volts. Probe four is reading the voltage at the other node in our parallel relationship. For those of you in possession with a copy of NI Multisim, get to know the measurement probe. They are extremely handy tools and extremely easy to use. Let's bring this lecture to a close by digging through the library and incorporating a new component in the last illustrated example problem. This component is a DC current source, part of the sources group and the signal current sources family. Let's use a 175 milliamp year current source to supply a parallel configuration of three resistors. R1 is a 690 ohm resistor, R2 is a 330 ohm resistor, R3 is also a 330 ohm resistor. Notice the placement of the ammeters. IS is our source current. I1 is measuring just the current through R1. I2N3 is measuring the current supplied to the parallel combination of R2 and R3. I2 and I3 are respectively measuring current supplied to only R2 and R3. Pause the lecture and use your understanding of Ohm's law, basic parallel circuit properties, Kirchhoff's current law, and the current divider rule to solve for the current indicated by each of the four ammeters in this circuit prior to simulation. Here's how I'm going to solve for the desired unknowns. You may have used different methods in a different order, but ultimately our answers should be in agreement. First, I'm going to apply Kirchhoff's current law to this circuit. Kirchhoff's current law suggests that IS equals I1 plus I2 plus I3. Given the location of the ammeters and the nature of a current source, IS must be the magnitude of the source current at 175 milliampers. I1, I2, and I3 will draw representative portions of this incoming 175 milliampers inversely proportional to the resistance magnitude. The additional ammeter, I2N3, is lumping together current drawn by both R2 and R3. Given the location of this ammeter measuring the current drawn by both R2 and R3, it would be a natural inclination to combine R2 and R3 in parallel into a single resistor I'll call R', prime, where R' prime equals a 330 ohm resistor in parallel with another 330 ohm resistor. Using the identical resistor in parallel shortcut, R prime is equal to 165 ohms. Now we can apply the current divider rule to solve for I1. The CDR set up to solve for I1 is I1 equals R prime divided by R1 plus R prime times our incoming current. Substituting in the necessary values, we find I1 equals approximately 33.8 milliampers. The source current not drawn by I1 continues on to the parallel combination of R2 and R3, our imaginary resistor R'. prime. We can solve for this quantity using another iteration of the unwieldy and confusing current divider rule or a quick and easy restatement of Kirchhoff's current law, where IS minus I1 equals I2 plus I3. Substituting in the given value of IS and the calculated value of I1, we can solve for I2 plus I3 to be the remaining 141.2 milliampers. Given the parallel combination of R2 and R3 receive 141.2 milliampers, these resistors will draw representative portions of this incoming 141.2 milliampers. Given R2 and R3 are identical resistors with the same voltage across them, it would be within our rights to declare that the incoming 141.2 milliampers of current will split equally between them. Any use of Ohm's law or the current divider rule will not only confirm this fact, but will also waste precious time doing so. Make use of the shortcut that current through identical resistors in parallel is the same. It stands to conjecture that if 141.2 milliampers of current enters a parallel combination of two identical resistors, regardless of the magnitude, half of 141.2 milliampers, or 70.6 milliampers, will travel through R1 and the remaining 70.6 milliampers will travel through R3. When we press play to simulate the circuit, the simulator confirms our calculations with a reasonable degree of accuracy capable of being displayed on the indicators. 
This ends our application of circuit simulation software to simulate and observe basic parallel circuit properties. Again, it was not my intention to perform an exhaustive review of NI Multisim, but rather employ generic circuit simulation software to simulate parallel circuit properties. This being said, I did briefly introduce the generic multimeter and ohm meter mode, the simulated Agilent multimeter, the watt meter, and my personal favorite, the measurement probe for purposes of analysis and observation. In conclusion, this lecture made use of circuit simulation software to observe basic parallel circuit properties. We observed that voltage across components hooked in parallel is the same and made use of this incredibly simple statement to determine unknown properties based off limited observations. We observed the largest current through the smallest resistor in a parallel relationship. We observed the smallest current through the largest resistor in a parallel relationship. We observe equal current through identical resistors in a parallel relationship. We observe the effects of opens and shorts in parallel relationships. Finally, we made use of Ohm's law, Kirchhoff's current law, and the current divider rule to analyze parallel circuits with the aid of circuit simulation software. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your Lazy Lab partner about this resource and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.